Now, Ms. Tashold, uh, what has your research revealed about the relationship between the dietary guidelines, obesity, and diabetes? Well, I, I urge you to take a look at this chart. What happens in 1980? This is obesity rates in the U.S. This is the beginning of our dietary guidelines. Um, this is a causation, uh, sorry, a correlation. It does not prove causation, but it is highly suggestive. And what you have to understand is the dietary guidelines, you know, I know everybody thinks, so oh, I don't go to a .gov website to get my dietary advice, um, but they are enormously influential. All, uh, all doctors, nutritionists, dietitians, they all key their advice back to the dietary guidelines. They're like the Bible. Um, and they are followed with a kind of religious uh, faith. <laughs> um, so anytime you go to any one of these frontline healthcare workers, your doctor or any of your trusted healthcare professionals, their advice is informed by the dietary guidelines. They also inform any kind of feeding program, at least in the United States. They're, so our school lunches, our feeding programs for the elderly, our military rations our um, women and infant children programs, any kind of feeding program that comes out of the government, at least in our government, is key to the dietary guidelines. They also just change the whole food supply. So all of our cattle have been bred to be leaner. All our food, all of our low-fat foods came out of the dietary guidelines. Um, our milk is non-fat, low-fat, all of that. So the whole food supply shifts with the dietary guidelines, and that's why um, it's plausible as you see here, the dietary guidelines is responsible for this dramatic uptick in obesity rates in the United States. I want to talk about what are, we just looked at a chart showing the uptick in, in obesity in the United States. What are other explanations for that increase in obesity rate? We need to consider what do other experts think about this? Um, and then the, pre the prevailing view, the review, the review of most experts is, it's our fault. We eat too much junk food and we exercise too little. And we do not follow the guidelines closely enough. So I want to review what the evidence is for those claims. First of all, here's a chart that I made that I hope that you can see. This is the best available data that we have for um, et that estimates consumption of foods in the United States from um, 1970 to 2005. Uh, and it shows that we really seem to have followed the guidelines. Everything in red or orange is something that we were told to eat more of, and we do eat more of. We eat more vegetables, we eat more fruits, we eat 41% we more grains, um, we eat more whole grains, um, we eat 91% more vegetable oils. We were told to increase those things, and we did. All the things in blue and green are things we were told to decrease, and we did. Animal fats down, eggs down, whole milk down, meat down, red meat is down. Here I break these out a little bit um, so you can see them more closely. Um, so although total meat consumption is up, that vast majority of that, as you can see, is chicken, but red meat is down 17%, as we've been told to do. Beef is down even more. This is all in the United States, but um, I've looked at data from other countries. I know Canada is exactly the same, even more dramatic. Um, we've increased fish. This is dairy consumption. The whole milk is, are, is down by 73 percent, and it's been replaced by skim or low. So it does seem, by all the best available data that we have from our government, that we have followed the dietary guidelines. So the argument that we simply do not follow the guidelines well enough is not supported by this data. Um, another explanation that we hear a great deal about is that, well, it's increased calories. It's all calories. Um, so this is an analysis done um, by um, Cohen et al. in t Nutrition in 2015. He looked at the um, he looked at the increase in calories and where it came from. So almost the entire increase in calories comes from carbohydrates, first of all. We're eating, in the US at least, we're eating about 250 more calories per day than we did 30 years ago. It's all carbohydrates. Um, so it's very hard to disentangle, bless you, it's very hard to disentangle those. We're increasing calories and we're increasing carbohydrates. He did an analysis um, trying to separate out those variables and came to the conclusion um, that it was not calories 
that was could be explained the increase in BMI over the past four decades. So on exercise, this is the other half of this idea. You know, we eat too much and we exercise too little. That's the basic explanation that is given now by all of our expert bodies. Um, and, I, and by way of countering that, I mean, there's a, there's a growing body of data out there. One paper I know that Professor Noakes has done, and this is, uh, I'm quoting from a, um, the U.S. government's most comprehensive report it ever did in reviewing all the data on exercise and weight loss. This was in 2008. And mind you, the U.S. government has a tremendous interest in trying to show that its exercise advice is, works because it recommends 45 to 60 minutes every day of aerobic exercise um, in order to simply maintain your weight, to not gain weight, um, which sounds completely exhausting to me. Um, but they could, they could not find that they looked at all the, uh, the randomized controlled clinical trials and could not find that that uh, advice was, um, they couldn't find that it helped you lose weight. It was insufficient by itself that, that um, a dietary intervention is needed. Uh, another way of saying it, that is that you cannot exercise your way out of a bad diet. Diet is the primary driver of weight. Um, they also did a study in the last dietary guideline report on sedentary behavior and could not find that that leads to obesity, which is good news for couch <laughs> potatoes. So this leads us to the possibility. Maybe, you know, maybe it is not our fault. Maybe it's not our fault that we don't exercise enough and that we overeat. Maybe we are not gluttons and sloths, as we are told. Um, maybe there's an alternative explanation, and that's what I'd like to discuss now, um, which is that. So here are, again, going back to our guide care guidelines, they're ours and yours, um, what they illustrate is the U.S. Dietary Guidelines and the South African Dietary Guidelines. You can see they're a little more clear on the, the, one, the U.S. version, that big bottom slab of, um, which is bread, cereal, rice, pasta, all carbohydrates. And um, you can see in the next slide that what we were told, what the low-fat diet did was to increase our carbohydrates, as you remember, the goal was between 55 and 60 percent of calories. That remains true today. All those blue bar charts are those are the three currently, the three dietary patterns currently recommended by the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. They're all uh, between 50 and 55 percent carbohydrates. And I really want to point out that green chart because that is the best available data that we have for what Americans ate before the obesity and diabetes epidemics. That's from 1965, that data. That shows that Americans were eating under 40% of their calories as carbohydrates, the entire population. And fats were at 45% of intake. This is for all Americans. So this, by any definition, you could say the entire American population was on a low-carb, high-fat diet in 1965. That was a typical normal diet, and uh, and so and and so that was that was the conventional advice <laughs> in 1965. What we've seen over the last since 1965 to 2011 is a massive shift. Carbohydrates have gone up by 30 percent because we have followed the guidelines, and fat has gone down by 25 percent because we have followed the guidelines, and saturated fat has gone down by 20 percent because we have followed the guidelines. Uh, this is perhaps redundant now, but just to show, again, what are the actual foods that we gave up in order to eat more bread, cereal, pasta, rice. Um, we've eaten more carbohydrates, and, the, and how is it that carbohydrates make you fat? I think this has been reviewed already before you by Professor Noakes, um, but the idea is that any kind of carbohydrate that you eat, even the supposedly healthy whole grains, your, translates in your bloodstream as glucose. Your body understands that as glucose. Glucose triggers the release of insulin from your pancreas. Insulin is like the king of all hormones for making you fat. It is a fat deposition hormone. Uh, and that leads to obesity. And then consistent exposure to glucose over the course, glucose spikes over the course of the day 
uh, you know, that's your cereal for breakfast and crackers for snack and uh, or Danish. Um, and then you have sandwich for lunch and pasta for dinner. That's that's exposure to glucose all day long. That um, that pr that pr prolonged exposure to insulin in your body, your body becomes exhausted, unable to process the constant exposure to insulin, and eventually you develop diabetes. So this is a new theory. This is a theory about obesity that is not calories in, calories out. Instead, it hypothesizes that it is something about carbohydrate calories specifically that are metabolized differently due to their insulin effect, so that carbohydrates has a uniquely fattening effect, and that it is not simply a matter of the mathematics of calories in versus calories out. So what is the evidence supporting this theory? Um, this is um, the question of, you know, what supports the so-called low-carb, high-fat diet? Um, I think it's really important to note, again, we were talking about low carbohydrate diets, not diet. There's a range of low carbohydrate diets. They range according to people's different, the way they study them and their different terms, anywhere from 5% of carbohydrates up to 45% of carbohydrates. Uh, in 1965, Americans were on a 45%, uh, were on a, sorry, a 39% carbohydrate diet. There are now more than 74 randomized controlled clinical trials, all on Western populations. At least 32 trials of the low-carb diet have lasted six months or longer. It's crucial to note that three trials have lasted two years. Okay, so because that is considered the gold standard length, at the, by two years, it is assumed that you will see any adverse health effects, any side effects of this diet. There have been three such trials, and they have revealed zero negative side effects of the low-carb diet. So these trials establish, at a minimum, that this diet is safe. And they also establish the outcomes of these trials show that it is, the diet is highly effective for fighting obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. It improves nearly all cardiovascular risk factors. I just want to talk about some complexities of the data, um, because it is a controversial topic. What does the data, what, what can we say from this data? What we can say is that the low, car, low carbohydrate diets are safe and have no adverse effects. Low carbohydrate diets are highly effective for people with metabolic conditions, obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Low carbohydrate diets are more effective than low fat diets. You have to remember the low fat diet has been tested in those large NIH trials on more than 50,000 people and shown to have no benefit. These diets have been shown to have benefit. And I've already discussed that there's a variety of low carbohydrate diets. I think what, what are the, there are limitations in the data still. And we think we really don't know very much. We haven't been studying these diets for so long. We don't know, it, you know, if some carbohydrates are worse than other carbohydrates. Is, you know, how does, how exactly is sucrose work worse than high fructose corn syrup or glucose and fructose and what are all the different advantages and are refined carbs at, are, are whole whole grains truly better for us than refined carbs or you know what are the different effects I think the, all of those questions are still really unfolding what the data show now is that restricting total carbohydrates of any kind is what is effective in these trials and this is just some data suggesting, you know, we all, I think that now there is an increasing move by public bodies to condemn sugar. I think definitely sugar, something we all agree is empty calories and not, and actually not good for you, but there's, a, there, the data doesn't necessarily support that it's all about sugar. Um, we've actually, in Canada and the U.S., sugar has been, sugar consumption has been declining in recent years whole grain consumption has been increasing and we have not seen a leveling off of, of obesity and diabetes. And I also want to address what are the criticisms of that, that are generally brought up about these diets. And then people say, well, and this is an intuitive criticism, but we know of populations in Japan or other places where people have lived on high carbohydrate diets, the rice diet in Japan, and they've been healthy. So how could it be? Or, or we know that people used to eat 
bread every day and lots of bread. And the ancient Egyptians ate bread. And they didn't suffer from the rates of obesity and diabetes that we do today. And I think that is a reasonable criticism. Um, and I think that we don't know exactly why carbohydrates are now driving disease more than they did in the past. We don't know if it's some combination of total carbohydrates plus sugar that has some especially negative metabolic effect. Uh, we don't know if it's that we've changed the way we produce wheat. We don't know if it's something about food processing. We don't know if it's vegetable oils plus carbohydrates. We really don't know. All we know is that if you restrict carbohydrates, you see benefit. Yeah. Ms. Tyson, what's the implication of that uh, for policy, the fact that if you reduce carbohydrates, you see benefit? Um, thank you. Well, I think there's two policy implications. One is that I just, I believe that this, the low carbohydrate diets should be considered one safe and effective option for people with metabolic conditions. I see no reason to demonize this diet, to call it a dangerous fad diet as has been done. It should simply be one of the options offered to people as parts as a matter of policy. Um, and if we want a population-wide recommendation, it seems like it would be perfectly fine to go back to what we ate in 1965, which is around 40% of calories of car as carbohydrates and 40% fat. That was, that, was, that was consistent with good health and, and a non-obese, non-diabetic population.